večer, dragi studenti i dragi kolege. Uh, well, of course, I will speak in English. Um, I would like to introduce to you our, our guest from Budapest, Professor uh, Nadia El Beheiri. Uh, she is for the first time in Belgrade, although Budapest and Belgrade are very close. Uh, I hope uh, it will uh, change um, uh, in future. Uh, first of all, I would like to, uh, to say a few general uh, facts about uh, our um, guest today and her uh, bi uh, biography. Uh, uh, she is graduated uh, uh, from University of Vienna and then she um, um, also kept uh, uh, specializing Roman law uh, in Italy uh, uh, at the University of uh, Sapienza in Rome and later on in Pavia. Uh, those are famous Corso di Perfezionamento in Diritto Romano and uh, other Collegio di Diritto Romano in Pavia. And um, she finally had her habilitation uh, at a Catholic University in Budapest. Um, um, later on, I discovered that we have her book in our library uh, in, our, in this uh, edition, Dunkler and Humblot. Um, and now she is head of um, department of Roman law at Pazmani Peter uh, Catholic University in Budapest. She is also editor in chief uh, uh, of their um, law uh, review. And what I found very interesting, she also is a vid visiting uh, lecturer uh, at a uni one university in Kenya. Um, well, uh, something about our uh, friendship, as I can say. Uh, we had uh, really many uh, possibilities. We had had many possibilities to meet earlier, but in fact, uh, uh, we started to get to know each other better uh, in the year 2019 in Edinburgh. Uh, at um, uh, our famous uh, SIDA conferences. Uh, SIDA uh, is, uh, in fact, uh, Societe Internationale de Droit de l'Antiquité. That means, of course, uh, um, uh, Society for Ancient uh, History, uh, which uh, took place uh, all over the world. And uh, we, in our conversation, we discovered that uh, we could have met in Bologna uh, and Ravenna a um, couple of years before uh, Edinburgh and later on uh, also in Krakow, but uh, finally the uh, main reason why we started to talk was Actio de Pauperie, that means animals, because as maybe you know, um, I wrote a dissertation on that subject and uh, Nadia also spe uh, um, was interested in that topic in Edinburgh. And so how we get in touch uh, closer. Later on, I was also in Budapest uh, as a guest of uh, her and also that department where there was a one um, uh, a meeting, uh, um, a round table or a workshop about uh, uh, experiences and challenges of um, teaching Roman law. Uh, well, uh, this is shortly about that. And I must say some words more, uh, because we had, uh, when we met today, uh, we were talking and I uh, showed her uh, uh, our faculty. She, I think she was very impressed as uh, I can uh, um, uh, uh, 
and, and I can hear from her um, uh, with our faculty and uh, okay, she didn't see a lot of Belgrade, but then um, um, she was also really, um, she couldn't believe that we have our meetings at Forum Romanum each Friday, she was thinking maybe once a month, but when she heard that we are, we, uh, we are able to organize that uh, every uh, Friday, this, this is something that uh, was really uh, something, uh, uh, surpri uh, let's say, uh, surprising for her at, uh, at least. Um, well, uh, so um, I, I just want to thank our students who are very important, uh, always a very important part of our auditorium. And also I would like to introduce some of my colleagues who are present here. Uh, first of all, uh, our professor of labor law, Lyubinka Kovacevic, um, this topic has something to do with it, uh, with uh, also with work. And uh, also she's in charge of our acta diurna. She um, uh, um, follows all and she knows all events uh, what, uh, which happened uh, with our colleagues. Uh, then uh, uh, Andrea, uh, Professor Andrea Katančević, uh, 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 pro, uh, um, full professor of Roman law. Uh, then uh, um, uh, uh, Valentina Cvetković Djordjevic, she is also our um, uh, um, professor of uh, uh, Roman law as well. And our youngest colleague, uh, uh, Vokashin Stanojlović, she is just um, doing his uh, PhD thesis. And I must add something. <laughs> when we were talking uh, today with, uh, um, at, uh, at our lunch uh, about uh, uh, colleagues of uh, uh, Professor Nadia, she told me uh, there are a few colleagues, but her youngest colleague, um, uh, who is now preparing her PhD thesis, is now going to have her seventh child. <laughs> and so she's expecting seventh child while she, she is working on her PhD thesis. And at the end, <laughs> really, so this is, uh, well, now uh, uh, last but not least, our Nina Kershlianin, who is also vice dean, and who is a spiritus movens of this uh, Forum Romanum. She organized everything. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, so, uh, and of course, with the help of other colleagues, uh, but uh, she is, um, uh, of course, without her, it will be difficult. Uh, so I think uh, it was enough for this introduction. Now I, we are very interested to hear your lecture, please. Okay, thank you very much. And it's true what Professor Apollo had said. I am really impressed of your activities on Roman law here in Belgrade and also of the Faculty of Law, I think, and also of the city. I think the city has a very, very nice atmosphere. So thank you again for inviting me, and I'm really very happy to be here. Sorry, just one second before. I just uh, had uh, wanted to say one uh, word. Uh, also in our discussion today, uh, I get to know that uh, our SIDA conference will uh, have place in Budapest, not this year, but next year. And it, uh, uh, it will be organized on three places. And one place will also be at Pasman University. So excuse me, this is what I forget to say. And it is, I think, important. Yes, yes, yes. The CEDA conference actually will take place in Budapest in 2025. So you are invited. The main organizer is, organizer is the University of Public Services. And there will be one day in the Calvinist University and another day in the Catholic one. 
Actually, it seems that the last session will be in the Catholic one. So thank you for this introduction again. And again, I can only say that I'm very happy to be here and to present some thoughts about, I think, a rather interesting and perhaps somehow unusual topic of Roman law. I have the topic which is freedom, solidarity, and subsidiarity through work in ancient Rome. The reason why I started to think a little bit on this topic was that sometimes when I was discussing work in ancient Rome and in ancient society with other colleagues also coming from other disciplines like philosophers or even theologians, we always hear that in Rome, in ancient world in general, the work, the labor, was not very much esteemed. And they came also always, they refer, of course, to the example of Greece, where even Aristoteles distinguished between otium and necotium, and those who were working in the modern sense of the word were performing physical tasks, tasks, physical work. These were mainly women and, and, and animals, and those who were really contributing to the society and contributing to the welfare of the society within the police, this was, <clears throat> this were the philosophers. And I was thinking, it might not be really true for the Roman experience. And then I was looking a little bit on the texts, and, and of course we find mainly texts of, of Cicero and of philosophers, and there we find a quite similar image of work, a quite similar picture of work. Might also have something to do that uh, Cicero himself is, was a homo novus, which is literally, of course, means a new man, the first of his family who came, started to do a political career. When we mm, speak in English, we might call him also a social upstart, and therefore he was distinguishing himself from other people who was doing physical work, and so he took all these Greek ideas and translated it as many times into Roman reality and into Roman society. So when I didn't really find literally testimonies on work, on the real work, on the experience, mainly on physical work also, I started to look in, in some other places. And of course, you might find um, tombs and also inscriptions. So if we uh, go away from the little testimonies and we focus more on, on other kind of testimonies, so we, we find one. And I think the, the most impressive one is the one I'm going to present you today, which is the tomb of Eurysakis. When he was a freedman, but we are going to speak about this point in, in detail. A few words um, on, on work in general in, in Roman experience. I think work, you used generally the, the term opere, and opere, the work can be, can, could be performed by free people. So you had a contract which was called the locatio conductio opere, which was um, perhaps some people were thinking that it might have been close to a modern working contract to our modern uh, contract, but other scholars, as for instance Wolfgang Weinstein says, perhaps it's not the one when we're trying to see to other contracts which might be similar to the modern experience, not looking at this locatio conductio opere, but he suggests to look on the opere libertorum, on those works which were performed by freedmen, by those who have been released by their owners, and they had still some obligation, and this obligation were many times called precisely opera, to perform um, for them. And there you had a long relationship, and you had duties and rights on both sides. So the freedman had the duty to work still for the one who, for his former 
um, owner and then the other way around. Also, the owner had still some social duties and responsibilities towards the freedman. So Wolfgang Wallstein, for instance, um, suggests that we might take the opere libertorum. Of course, opere, this term, referred to services regardless, regardless of the concrete um, outcome, only the, the service which we perform. We had um, another contract, which was the locatio conductio operis, which was the one who focused um, on, on the outcome. So this is one time. I, I was really interested in this term of, of work, of physical work, not this point we might uh, see the political activities or even, and we will come back to this, um, agricultural activities, but really a uh, physical work. Then we have another point, which is, of course, interesting in Roman law, which is um, the issue of um, slavery. And I, I gave um, to this conference and also a paper I wrote the title Freedom, Solidarity, and Subsidiarity, um, which are like modern expressions, of course, uh, modern terms, um, because I think we might, in Roman law and in Roman tradition, many times find um, items, ideas, also sometimes um, concepts which are which paved the way for modern humanism. We might say can look it from another way around, which paved the way for uh, Christian thinking ish and sometimes. So this was one point. We have the work, the idea of work that I was looking on, then and other modern concepts we might see. And then the third point was, of course, the one of, of slavery, which was in the Roman experience rather uh, different uh, than in the so-called modern slavery which is the slavery, you might imagine, of the American experience, and, and so on, and other experiences there. Of course, slavery is one of the most uh, darkest experiences in human activity. And I remember when I started, as Milena mentioned, to teach uh, some Roman law issues in an African experience, in an African surroundings. When I prepared first, I, I was thinking, Perhaps I have to be a little bit careful uh, on the topic of slavery. And then I, I looked at the digest and I looked at the cases I have and I say, okay, perhaps if, if I left out slavery, if I'm not going to deal with slavery. And then at the end I realized, of course, that I can't teach really Roman law if I uh, don't speak, do not speak about uh, slavery. And it was really an, an interesting experience. So slavery in Roman society, in Roman experience, as in ancient experience, was a rather a common and, and normal thing. And I find this expression very interesting, which is from a German-British scholar that I quoted here also in, on the slide. It said the Romans were not thinking about slavery so much as using the concept of slavery to think with. So the Roman people didn't think um, if slavery is just or not just, also they had the expression of just slavery, of course, but it um, wouldn't have come into their mind to, to abolish slavery. There was no discussion of abolishment of slavery, but they used the expression, they used the experience to think with, which, mean, which means, which meant for them to think in legal concepts of slavery. We might mention this idea of the schiavo manager, of the, to put sometimes a slave as the head of an enterprise. Schiavo manager, this was first coined by an Italian scholar, Andrea Di Porto, who wrote a, a book with this title, the schiavo manager, but also the Hungarian scholar, the Hungarian professor, Andrea um, Andras Ferdi, and worked on this um, topic. So we had the idea of different forms of slavery. Uh, another point is that also I realized it in my African experience that slavery in Rome were, was never based on racial items. It was not the color of the skin or, or whatever other um, things which might come into uh, our mind. 
slavery, this is a quotation also from a German scholar, Elisabeth Hermann Otto. She says, no, potentially, every free man in Rome could become a slave, and the other way around. Every slave could became, become a free man. And this is also a an, an, an very um, interesting and special point. And this has had something to do with the third quotation I put here on the slide, which is according to natural law, all men are created equal. This sounds that it might come from a human law de declaration or human rights declaration or something like that, but no, it's not from a human rights declaration, but it is from a Ulpian, a jurist that you might know, from the third um, century um, after Christ. This has something to do, so um, how do we, can we put these two terms together? We, we had slavery, of course, and um, where slavery was, from a legal point of view, was a unified concept, but the social reality of slaves might have been very different. We find different situations of slaves, and sometimes you couldn't distinguish really a slave uh, from a free man. When, when you looked on them on outside, there was no special clothing or no special uh, issues that you could uh, realize in them. So this was uh, one point. So connecting these two ideas of the issue of work and um, the issue of slavery, I thought perhaps we can look on um, modern concepts, how we can realize them and how we can um, find um, them. And so I thought uh, modern items like this solidarity, subsidiarity, and, and also dignity, uh, we, might, we can, might say that they are concepts ante literam without a reflective um, um, formation, formulation of um, ideas that we might find also in the Roman reality and in the Roman society. So these are like three points in which are coming together in, in this uh, presentation. And when I looked on uh, possible sources, I found um, this um, tool that I'm going to uh, present to you. But still some words about uh, work in ancient Rome. We have these items in, in ancient Rome. We can say it's labor, opus, opera, uh, negotium. And we have also the, the Hungarian uh, munka, which seems um, something to, uh, which seems to come from a Slavic word, of course, and which means something like tortures, suffering, troubles. And so all those expressions we have, uh, we have like a, a little bit a negative approach um, to work, um, it seems so, and it focuses on the difficulties um, of work. And we have it through an experience during many years, focusing mainly to the difficulties of works. So uh, neither in ancient nor in modern um, experiences, we might um, find a term which is an, an identity-creating character, which has an identity-creating character that uh, not only focuses on the idea that we have to work and we are going to suffer, but our identity is um, made out by our activity and by our work. This is an idea somehow really which we might found in, in finding in modern philosophers, no? That I am con constituted somehow by my uh, work or people finds the place in society through their work. And the place in society in the Roman experience was mm, descri described by the item of dignitas, of, of dignity. We have this uh, dignity, it's also a modern expression, it's a typical modern expression, we might say, uh, which is coming from the Roman experience, which is a, a big, a literal almost um, translation from the Roman experience, but in modern life, it has a, like a, a Christian approach also, the dignitas that every man, every human being has dignitas, but in Roman, in the Roman experience, dignitas 
showed you the experience within the society. So when we have this very famous um, definition of justice, in, which means that um, to give to everybody what is due to him, so Cicero, we have a quotation that to give to everyone what is due to him according to his or her dignitas. So dignitas was the idea uh, that you have a, a specific place in the hierarchical structure of the society. And then also um, we have um, in this quotation of Cicero like um, different um, activities. Hmm? Um, he distinguished somehow these activities which he called artes uh, liberales, which were those artists which were proper of a free man, of an important um, part of society. And on the other hand, he has, it was uh, called um, activities which quisordi sunt, and um, these are activities which are not very, which has not, have not a very high esteem. We don't really know what was the, the point of distinction. It was uh, surely different than in modern life, because a medicus, for instance, a, a medical doctor, has, had not had a very high esteem. He was a low esteem. Uh, many times a medical doctor was a slave, and the same way uh, many times a teacher was a slave. So um, it's like a, a, a different point sometimes. Let me feel approach students and say, okay, in ancient society, the teacher were your slaves, so you can approach them in, in, in another way. You know? But um, for instance, uh, dealing with agriculture had a high esteem. Perhaps also in Greek society, because uh, the, the point of reference was if the work, the activity you performed made you grow in virtue, and the people thought, ancient people thought, that dealing with agriculture made you grow in, 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 in virtue, hmm? made of you a virtuous man. Or perhaps we might also think that some uh, points of the original um, acquiring of, of property were connected to agriculture. As for instance, we can say to acquire fruits of a land or also the fruits of your hunting. These are all um, original terms of acquiring properties um, connected um, with, um, with land. The point which has not have a very high esteem was a um, physical work, and um, or at least this is the, the common idea we many times found that physical labor, work, physical activity, had not have a very high esteem, and it was somehow proper to slaves or to uh, people with a low. Um, esteem in, in society. And um, the idea I have, um, and I'm going to show you, is that it's not necessarily um, in, in, in this way. So we can go a little bit further on, only very briefly, on the three points I have. Solidarity means each member of a community acknowledges its own responsibility to contribute to the common good. This is from an Italian scholar, which is called Pierangelo Donati. And um, each member of a community acknowledges its own responsibility to contribute to the common good, to the common good of society, to the bonum comune um, within um, society. This is the idea of solidarity, which is a, an interesting um, definition. Of course, we can say also a slave might contribute to the common good within society, but it's not through free activity, through his own activity. We can also say animals somehow contribute to the common good and if they do their work or bring in their work, but it's not through their own decision. And this um, idea of solidarity means through my own decision, through my own contribution, through my free contribution, I help society to go forward. I, I am a member 
of um, society. Then we have the, the other one, the, the third one, which is subsidiarity, which is also a modern term, of course, which means somehow assisting others to fulfill their duties according to their own possibility and place in society. This is perhaps also a little bit different a definition, which we might follow, for instance, in the usual one in, in connection with the European Union, principle of society. But we, here we have somehow a deeper one, because we say, OK, I am fulfilling my duties according to my own possibility in, in the society. So I am standing where I am, and there I am trying to contribute uh, to society. And of course, the Roman society was a highly uh, hierarchical, hierarchical um, society, and therefore everybody knew where his or her place was in society. And then the third point was the one of dignity. The dignity according to his place in society, as we already said, and is somehow described through this um, Latin item, which is this familia pecuniaque. Familia meant, of course, the, the family, and pecunia was the assets, was the money. In this um, book that uh, Professor Poliwayats also described, I, I was like looking on this place in society and of poor people, and the censor, the Roman censor, they had even a magistrate who fixed the place, and I think he fixed it according this familia pecuniaque. According to the family they had, they had to go to the censor, to, the, to go to the magistrate and tell if they were married or not, and if they had children, and all the uh, other interesting items uh, regarding um, their family activity. And the other one were the assets and um, the pecunia um, they had. So this familia pecuniaque, I think we might find it also in our tomb. So we have um, somehow the, the surroundings um, of the tomb, and now we are going to, to approach uh, the content. I'll show you um, a picture. This is um, the tomb um, we might focus on which is from Marcus Vergilius Auritzades, and it said Pistor, which is a baker, and Redemptor, which is a, a contractor. This tomb, and of course, the picture we might see here, hopefully you can see it properly, and this picture, in this tomb, is a reconstruction we find a museum in Rome, which is the Museo della Civiltà Romana. I, I recommend it highly for you, for, for everybody who is dealing with, with Roman law. And there we find reconstructions, not original items. There, for instance, you can have a look on the law of the Twelve Tables and, and things like that. And so um, there are reconstructions. Uh, but um, it, it's very interesting to go there. And also the tomb, we find it. Um, from the, in the Museo della Civiltà Romana. It was uh, rediscovered, actually, in the year 1838. It was in the Via La Picana in, uh, and in, in the Via Prenestina, which was, um, they discovered it when they removed the old uh, city wall. This was an, an interesting um, point. The tomb can be qualified as extraordinary from many perspectives. Um, the monument is about eight and a half meters high, so it's huge, really. And it's situated in a quite central place, at least from the perspective of an ancient spectator. Everybody who exited or who came into the city, into the city of Rome, passed, had to pass necessarily by the tomb. And it dates from the late first century BC. So it's a very um, ancient one. And it's somehow built on a trapezoidal ground plan. The unusual arrangement is most probably due to the necessity to make it fit around an aqueduct they had there. 
looking at the mon monument, we can somehow um, distinguish um, three levels, and I think you see it there, we can distinguish three level levels. The ground line made out of tough blocks, and then the second uh, level with travertine, and then we have these cylinders there, we, you, you see it, and um, we have um, horizontal cylinders and vertical cylinders. And um, there's a discussion of, um, in, within scholarship, what those cylinders might be. But um, there is an idea that those cylinders might be knitting machines. And um, they were used um, to, in, in bakery, actually. If this is true, it might be the only ancient example um, of using everyday stuff, everyday materials in funeral arts. Hmm? You can uh, imagine they really used it or somehow uh, used it and then they represented it in, in a funeral art in the tomb. So this is like the, the main um, item um, we see here. And then of course we see in the middle a picture, a big picture of Eurytokis, of our main um, actor in in this story um, with his wife. And so, and we have also the name of the baker. It's like Marcus Vergilius Arisades, and he's telling it like three times on, on three different sides um, of um, this monument. He is repeating his name, Marcus Vergilius Arisades. And it's a telling composite. The name Marcus and Vergilius were taken most probably from the family who set him free. And we have um, the original Eurytsakes or Eurytsakes, um, which is um, from the Greek language, of course, and which means something like a broad shield. So we have the four. Um, a reflection on, on both items, on his Greek um, origin and also um, in his relationship, on his relationship to the freedman's family. Most probably it was not he himself who he was freed, but um, already his father um, or his grandfather. We also do not find any yeah, sign of that there might have been opera, that there might have been um, an obligation of his side um, to perform services for the family who freed him. This might have several, re several reasons, perhaps actually he was freed by his grandfather. His grandfather was the one who was freed, but it might be also that he might have been freed by a last will because um, if you are freed by a last will, you have no obligation to perform opera services because they say that um, you're, the person you're freed with is already in another world and there you don't need your services. So we have this point. Hmm? The inscription is repeated uh, like three times, and every time we have this pistor and redemptor. So he was a baker and a contractor. These are three items which Cicero actually might qualify as activities with a very low esteem. And here in the monument, he, he like proudly repeated it three times. This is um, the point we see. Here we see the cylinders in a proper way, and this is somehow not the reconstruction, but is the tomb we might see today if we watch the original one. So if you pass by, perhaps you don't really realize that it is an interesting uh, tomb. Um, but we, we have still the cylinders that we see very much. And then we can go um, a, a little bit um, further, and we will see here we have like the inscription, so we can see a little bit. This is the one which is repeated three times the way around. And then we have these friezes there. We have three of them. And it's also very interesting because if you look on them, 
And from downstairs, if you were an Asian spectator, you didn't really see them. You saw that you have a huge monument, and you saw that it was from Enrique Zetz. You saw, you saw his himself and his wife, but you didn't see that the story he is telling um, around um, on the friezes. Therefore, you had um, to have a better look in, on them. And this is the point we might do now. But before going it, this is not from the monument here, but this is a famous one, perhaps somebody recognizes it. And um, this is the one from Domitius Ahenobarbus, and um, it, is, it is like uh, showing you the final performance of a census when they are offering the, the, the things from the census. And um, I, I put it because it reminds you very much of the friezes we are going to see now. It reminds you very much on, on the history. It reminds you very much on, on, on the outlook that um, the um, architects um, of the tomb were using. This was the final performance of the census, which means it was the final performance of the moment when the magistrate, who was in touch of putting everyone in the place, in his place within society, and then he had to perform um, a sacrifice. And so, most probably, or, or perhaps at least, those who made um, these freezes we are going to have a look now, um, they had in mind those, um, this one of, of the censor, of the final performance of the censor. So it, it's very, very similar. The idea behind is that through work, through activity, um, he gained his position uh, within society, which is like a completely um, different approach. Through so his activity, he, he carried out, he gained the position in society the same way that other people gained it, perhaps through military achievements or through political achievements or through wealth. And here we have another one. And this is like um, the, the first uh, one we, we might have a look on, the first um, freeze um, we have um, here. So here we, we, we will see three of them now, and they will be in a similar construction somehow. We have always in the middle like a central picture. And then we have some activities um, around uh, this um, central picture. And so at this point, we can um, also see um, in, in the middle, it's like the starting position of making bread. We have here most probably one of these kneading machines, and we, 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 say, oh, we saw already. And then um, here, perhaps in, in the one side, um, if we look at it, that um, there's a man with a mule. We might be bringing the grain to the kneading machine. And then in the other side, we see somehow officials that they are working um, with the outcome of, of the whole um, thing. We see different people. We see ones with have a long tunica, uh, this may, might be somehow an official, perhaps a magistrate. Then we see others with a, a short tunica. These are the ones who are working. And then we see also a smaller uh, person depicted in the, in the very end of the picture. And um, this might be a slave, because in order to distinguish a free person from a slave, the slaves were sometimes depicted in, in a smaller format. And that because from outside you couldn't see really if it's a free pe person or it's a slave, and so they make him a, in a smaller one. So this is like the starting point. You don't really have, a, a, you, can, you can't really read them in, in a logical way, but perhaps this is the starting point of a, making, a, making a bread.
Then here we have the second one, which is also an, an interesting one. We see that people have, um, they, they are sitting down, and it's also interesting that if you focus on those people who are sitting down, most properly kneading the loaves, um, you, you can't really put the feet together with the bodies. Um, you, you, you see that um, it's, uh, you will have a really hard work if you try uh, to put, to, to count on the feet there and, and to uh, put them to a correspondence body. They are like independent one from each other, so it's a sign that it's a history. And it, it, all the people were depicted there, you, you don't know who they are. It's, it's also interesting. You can't even see um, if we have our baker there. And, and somebody asked me, perhaps they have his son here, but, but you, 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 you don't know, you do not know it. Hmm? They are general people, so they are not focusing on the people, but they're focusing on the activity. And this is an interesting point. And then um, here we have on um, the other point, um, the last one, it's like an oven, and, and it looks like a modern pizza oven, perhaps, no? And we, we can imagine it is. And this is, and we have it from the uh, first century um, BC. It's, it's an interesting point. Then here we have another one. We have, again, the, the point that um, he describes what we have here in the middle is a scale. And of course, the idea of a scale is rather obvious. So he wants to tell us that he is an honest man, that he is um, putting it together and, and, and having the bread um, is like in in equal condition with the price. And this um, doctor of students of mine who is now finishing her PhD thesis, uh, she is actually writing on the Justum Pretium and um, on this uh, sentence that Ulpian, um, Ulpiano said that um, in the price that the people can cheat a little bit. This is a quotation, famous um, quotation from the Circumvenire um, of um, Ulpian. And we can say it was allowed somehow, or it was a general experience that regarding the price, everybody was like looking his, for his um, own advantage. And here our baker says, no, he is looking for justice regarding the bread and regarding um, the price. It's, and, and then we, we can hear here in the corner people in baskets like carrying in, away the, the bread. It might be somehow the, the final station. So we had the beginning, then we had the break make, bread making process, and here we are already selling the bread, bread and, and taking it um, away. Then the next um, point we have is um, this picture of Eurysachus and his um, wife. Um, and uh, beyond the couple, we see um, the inscription. We have here a very um, old Latin. You, you might see it on, on different items. And here he said, Atistia, it's the English translation, and translation was my wife. A most excellent lady in life, the surviving remains of her body are here in this bread basket. No, it says a um, panario. Um, and it was perhaps sometimes quite usually that we have the remains and the ashes of the people in, in the bread basket. Um, there was found one bread basket there, one, one urn was found within the picture of Eurysachus, uh, not more. Some scholars think that this whole monument might have been built for uh, the wife. Uh, it was the, the boring place um, of the wife. And um, if we focus on it, um, we, we see mm, that he is like underlining also his, his marriage and his relationship um, to his wife. Perhaps um, you, we might expect a conjunctio manus. Sometimes we find that they have the hands like together, which is a sign um, of um, a Roman marriage. 
but here we do not find it, but um, we see that it is um, an ancient language and we, he is also repeating the virtues um, of, of his wife. And here we have like the point. And also we find around the whole place, we find like um, other inscriptions from, um, from other funeral monuments that um, didn't, we, 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 have, we don't have uh, remainings of them, but we have one inscription that was um, found, which was a man who was named Ogulnius, and there we had, um, we, he was uh, the baker of white bread, white bread, and he was a friend. We find so most probably when building this whole thing, there were many people around. So perhaps it might have been a funeral society. So this is also the point. The baker, through his profession, got into relationship with other people with other friends, and most probably there might have been um, also um, other, um, other similar tombs, perhaps, or funeral events there. So we have here bake of white bread, which is something special, because usually in Rome, also in the Twelve Tables, we find in the mentioning they were using not white bread, but black bread. He was the baker of white bread. And he said also he was amicus, he was um, a friend, and they don't de really tell us to whom he was the friend, uh, but we might um, suppose that it was um, our baker, Eurysacus. So this is um, also, when we look a little back, a little bit back to the um, point, we said that um, our baker, he inserted himself into Roman society through his profession and as a baker. The profession of a baker, which he again repeats um, three times, gave him his status, his uh, dignitas. Dignitas in this context derives from his profession, from his work. He really, he himself contributed to the common good of society and he also, we might imagine, that he was um, giving the possibility to work for other people, for free people perhaps, within a locatio conductio or operarum, um, or we might also imagine that there were, might have been working um, some slaves. So he himself provided for other people also a place um, in uh, society. And then we can also see near to the tomb, other architectural remains were found. Perhaps we can think that there we have a royal society. And this is also that through his profession of baker, he entered, he demonstrated solidarity in his own surroundings. So these were a little bit the ideas. I have here with our with the tomb of our baker, of our friend, the baker, and, and if there are any questions, I will be most happy to answer them. Thank you for your attention. You can go back here to the picture, but we have a nice picture in the background. A very quick question, perhaps, which is not, it perhaps more obvious to someone who's an expert on the subject, but how normal is the tomb of this size and this degree of decoration for a baker, for, a, for an artisan? Not at all. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's a very unique tomb, but it's a very unique, and um, also we have some famous big tombs in Rome, but they were not for, for bakers. So, so, so how would you explain this? 
Was he a tremendously successful baker? Or of course, he must have been a tremendously successful baker and also a tremendously rich man. Uh, because in, in order to, to bake like a tomb like this, you need a, a lot of money. And bread was used, of course, and in, in was needed by the army, so most probably he m might have delivered bread to the armies, and this was a, a, a big source of income, and also bread, of course, everybody needed uh, bread. So it seems that he must have been a, a baker in a large scale. So he was not a, a small baker, of course, but he was a baker in a large scale. This might also be an, an item that also Cicero might, might have accepted him, because for Cicero, um, the work in a smaller scale to be uh, commercial, to contribute to commercial life in a small scale was a not esteemed activity. But in the moment that you started to do it in a large scale, he also started to accept it and, and esteemed it higher. So we might say our baker also might have um, experienced some uh, social estimation and also social recognition. But the point is that he achieved it through his profession, through his activity as a baker. Yes. Thank you very much for the uh, interesting presentation. I would like to ask you something about the Lopez of Produzio Opera. Uh, if I remember well, or if I uh, heard well, uh, one of your thoughts was that uh, the Lopez of Produzio Opera was included between the Dominus and the Freedom. No, 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 the Locatio Conductio Operarum, not the opere and Operarum were between the Terminus and the Freedmen. The Locatio Conductio Operarum was a contract for free people. The okay. free people. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And, but the, the, the idea I tried and I took actually from Weinstein was normally, most probably, or perhaps, the Locatio Conductio and Operarum was many times for very short periods. So, for a day, many times. No? So we can imagine, and, and sometimes you see it also in cities, that in the morning somebody is going out looking for people who might work, then he take him, they took him and he take them in a car and bring them somewhere where they perform um, tasks. This was somehow the idea of loca mostly of locatio conductio um, operarum. If you have a relationship which is in a very short time, like this one, so all the, the, the problems and items we have with a modern contract of work, they cannot um, come up. Because if you work only for one day, you have no social um, items behind. And so the point was that Wolfgang Weinstein said that um, all these social um, items connected um, with work nowadays perhaps do not come from the Locatio Conductio Operaro because there was still no possibility, but they come from uh, the opera um, Libertorum, from the opera performed by a uh, freedman, by manumitted um, slaves. More questions? Yes. May I ask you something? Um, I'm interested about the, the size of it. Uh, so, is the si size known? Uh, because I'm confused, I don't know, is it uh, the door on the bottom of uh, a picture? Yes, most probably it's the door, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. but, but the whole uh, monument is known, it's saying that it's um, eight and a half meters. The other things are not exactly known because you see uh, this, the remains we have um, are a smaller ones, so they are like taken out from other experiences. Okay, thank you. And one question: uh, uh, I have never been in uh, Rome, so my question: where I can, if I go there, where I can uh, uh, find it? It's now the, the Via Labritana. You have it. And it's like. A rather central place um, of Rome today. Is it but very I can't. 
No, it's not close to the Colosseum, but, but I can write you very fine. But you put it also on the internet and you find it. <laughs> and, and, and actually, when I was there the first time, I, I didn't realize it, because you have many, many, many high walls in Rome, and, and perhaps you don't even realize that it's a special one, because you see something like that, not this was the, you, you see, and you pass by this, you have many uh, items of those in Rome, and you think, ah, one more. But if you go a little bit deeper, so it, it's an interesting point. Okay, thank you. Okay, yes. I, yeah, it's interesting also to, to me, uh, this baker uh, declares himself as a baker and a redemptor. And so that means that he was working, uh, he was a craftsman at the same time, also businessman. I was, I'm thinking um, <laughs> about um, pos uh, position nowadays. Uh, I try to compare because we have a lot of bakeries around <laughs> in, our, in our city. And I think uh, nobody uh, of these uh, owners, uh, they are only businessmen and not uh, at the same time craftsmen. So this is interesting uh, to, to think about uh, situ uh, how the uh, situation changes nowadays and about uh, different um, um, uh, the different attitude to towards uh, different jobs and uh, uh, professions. Uh, um, for example, in this case, I think it is divided. Um, or somebody is a baker, and this is really hard work, and another is owner and uh, own businessman. In this, uh, and this is not, uh, in this case, as I can. And uh, imagine that this, this baker is proud with his own skill of making the bread as well, and at the same time being manager and um, contractor. And this contract would be a con uh, locatio conductio opens, isn't it? Yes, I think I it think was so. actually. It might have been somehow with public services, of course, something to do when he was selling his bread to the army or to militaries or to a magistrate. And at the end, I think it was locatio conductio operis also, yes. Most probably, yes. And, and the, the other point of the baker, <laughs> it comes now to, into my mind that also Cato, many years before, and um, he was working on an agricultural part, but he was also saying that he was uh, working on the land together with his slaves. <coughs> and he was proud that he was working together with his slaves. And so somehow it might have been an attitude also that um, when you are the, the owner, you, you don't sit in a nice um, office perhaps um, behind, behind a computer and organizing the word of the other people, the work of the other people, but you are really there and, and you are really working with them. And he might have taken this idea also from the ideal of perhaps even agricultural works, no? that also the one, at least ideally, who was the owner of a big farm, was supposed to not only organize the big farm, but also to work there. Yeah, this, is, uh, this is a problem of nowadays because nobody wants to work this manual work somewhere and everybody wants to be a manager <laughs> or something like that. More questions, comments, ideas? Well, I have yes. one question, but I don't want to get too philosophical, but it seems interesting to me that when you mentioned in the beginning this concept of dignitas, and basically uh, it seems like this is the, the beginning of what we see actually 
today, as, as, as it has been mentioned also, a question of status. Of uh, it, it's interesting to me this concept that actually uh, we are that everyone is defined by by what they do, what their work is, and especially that <laughs> I, I don't know if it's true to say, but this obsession with work, it's more. Uh, it's interesting to me that actually. It's it, that it, it is re re represented at the end of someone's life as a, some kind of culmination that we can see actually. <laughs> that, uh, do you think it's uh, it's possible to draw that draw that parallel? Basically, it's like we uh, can see the, some kind of roots uh, of what is developed, perhaps with the start of the industrial revolution. That we see that here, and uh, what what is actually the beginning of Western civilization, ancient Rome. Yes, I think that's a very good comment. Not that uh, also nowadays uh, people are defined somehow about what they are doing. The position in society might be defined um, through their work. That might have many good sides. But perhaps it might have also some problems, no? If you are only defined by your work, what you uh, are able to achieve, you are able to perform, you, you are like, like fun from the very functional uh, side of your life, it might be also difficult. Hmm? And therefore, I, I, I think the, the, the question actually, term of dignity, of dignitas is a very different one. When you say it's not about what you performed, what you have um, succeeded to do in your life, but it is because you are a human being. Actually, if you see it from a Christian point of view, because you are created in the image of God. This was like a very different approach, and I think you have to put these two items together. Because we can see you had the Roman um, image of dignitas, and then we have somehow the question one, and then through the newer times, we take again the concept of dignitas, but perhaps sometimes putting into bracket somehow the question idea, and then we arrive perhaps back to the Roman one. So, so it's an interesting note. It might be also very interesting to follow this concept of dignitas through the centuries, which is a, yeah which is a good task. Thank you for the question, yeah. Anyone else? Well, if not, let's thank the professor once more.